G'day and welcome to The Other Side Interviews, our weekly interview show that streams every Tuesday night at 6pm on ADH TV and is on demand for you to watch or listen to anytime you like on ADH or your favourite podcast platform. I'm Damien Curry and tonight's guest is one of Australia's most admired entrepreneurs in the tech space. Matt Barry, he has a pretty worrisome thesis about where our country is headed that I think we should all be aware of. Matt is the CEO and founder of Freelancer.com, an online freelancing and crowdsourcing marketplace. He holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University in the United States. In 2011, he was named the inaugural BRW Entrepreneur of the Year and was named in the 10 most influential people in Australian IT by the International Business Times. In 2014, Smart Company Magazine named Matt the most influential person in technology in Australia. A couple of weeks ago, Matt gave a speech at the Sydney Morning Herald's Sydney 2050 Summit entitled The Great Australian Scream. Matt joins me now from his Sydney office and I might point out, Matt, that backdrop is not a video screen. You are literally in front of a live window there. Um, great, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Damien. Why The Great Australian Scream? Well, I think every Australian would realise that when you go to the pub and your schooner of beer now costs $12, 13 $14, but sometimes $15, your landlord's jacking up your rent by 10 or 15%. Uh, you know, the banks are jacking up your mortgage 100 200 300%. You know, that your energy bill's up 20 25%, that something is terribly wrong in this country. And um, I think that successive generations, successive governments, this is not, this is not one government, this is many governments, have taken the path of easy, relentless growth in this country. And the path of easily relentless growth they've chosen to take is pray that you know commodity prices go up. We, we are a very primitive country in terms of what we export. We dig out of the ground basically dirt, which is iron ore, stick it on a boat and ship it to China. We um, dig out dead trees, which is basically coal, and ship it overseas to Japan and, and China. And, and lately, gold prices have been up, so you've been doing okay with gold, and gas prices have been up, we've been doing okay with, with, with gas. And, um, and while hoping that they continue to rise, and they have been rising for a while, although um, iron ore and coal and gas have come off the boil lately, uh, in between that, let's just keep pushing house prices up, right? So house prices have gone up over the last 60 years, 86 times. Uh, and government policy, absent of hoping and praying that commodity prices go up, commodities that we don't elaborately transform into higher end goods, such as you know petrochemicals and, and, and so forth, um, have led to a, a situation where the country uh, where has manufacturing as a percentage of, 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 of GDP on par with a financial haven like, like Luxembourg, right? It's mm. On par with Botswana, where you can go see cheetahs. So, so in the meantime, they've just been pumping house prices and they pump house prices quite simply. House prices don't go up because wages are going up. Wages haven't been going up for a very long time. In fact, uh, many years ago, Matthias Cormann said that uh, suppressing wages was really a, a, an arch, an arch, uh, by, by design uh, in our economic architecture. And it's not because we're having more babies. In fact, the Australian population, every woman on the planet needs to have 2.1 children to maintain the population. I think we're currently about 1.6 in Australia. Yeah. And we haven't been above 2.1 since 1975. The only reason why house prices are going up is because we're bringing more people into the country. In fact, last yep. year, 400,000 people equivalent to the uh, population of Canberra, right? Now, the, pro the problem is we can't build enough houses to house these people, right? Um, the federal government's just recently announced they're going to build 1 million homes by 2029. On the current rate of bringing people in, there'll be 1 million homes for 3 million people, right? right? Um, yeah, it's extraordinary. Let, just, uh, right now, let's go back to, if I could just interrupt, and go back to what you were saying initially and just... Uh, it's a lot to digest, but just taking it one step at a time, you've got this situation where we are completely dependent on, well, significantly dependent upon coal and gas exports, yet we are turning off the tap on both gradually, which will leave us with iron ore, which I think our major customer, China, is finding other sources. There's more supply that's driving iron ore prices down. If iron ore prices go down and we stop trading in gas and coal because we want to be all net zero, 
What does that leave Australia with but to flog off its space uh, to, to a bigger immigration policy? Well, it leads us to our fifth biggest export, which is called uh, uh, education related travel services, which is a euphemism for immigration dressed up as education, which is a $30 billion a year industry where we have 620,000 students in the country and everybody knows they're not students. Uh, there are there are low cost workforce that's being brought in uh, and they're being brought in to prop up GDP, not GDP per capita, but GDP and uh, work in the cell or, or drive an Uber. Right. And in fact, it's pretty amazing. I saw yesterday in the newspaper that of the nine universities in New South Wales, eight of them are losing money despite record numbers of students in the country. Um, the universities aren't making any money. And so you go, this is a bit strange. What's actually happening? You know, are these actually really, really students or are they going through the vocational ed education system and the other RTOs and so forth? Right. And there's something else going on. Right. And and and, and really, I think it's late stage uh, uh, desperation in a Ponzi scheme. I mean, the, the housing market going up you know, for 60 years, effectively, uh, relentlessly, has led to a, a Ponzi of all proportions. I mean, it's a, it's a housing bubble of all bubbles. In the global financial crisis, you had bubbles in the housing market in the United States, you had bubbles in the UK, you had bubbles in Ireland, Portugal, and so forth. And what we did in, in 2008 is we doubled down. And already in, in 2008, Australian households were more in, twice as indebted to the housing market than the Americans were. So Australia now, household debt's about 211%, uh, which is double uh, to, to GDP, which is double the US, a country that you normally associate with credit cards and debt. Households are basically at the at, at breaking point and, and mortgages are skyrocketing. Um, we're currently at 3.85% in terms of the interest rate, which is lagging uh, the US, the UK and Canada, which are four and a half to, to, to five and a bit. And um, we're at the point now where it's a complete replay of the movie, The Big Short. The Big Short, which is the great financial crisis, we had Steve Carell. You yep. had this iconic scene where he went to a strip club and he had a stripper dancing saying she had five houses and uh, a condo. And she was on what's called adjustable rate mortgages, right? These adjustable rate mortgages were written about two, at about 2% 2 interest rate, but after two to three years exploded about 200, 300% higher. And that's exactly what's happening right now in Australia is that all these mortgages during, during COVID were written about 1.95%. And this quarter, 17% of all fixed rate mortgages will come off uh, those low rates and, and, and go up to a much, much higher rate. And by the latest uh, data I saw, the mortgages are now 7 8%. And if rates go up next week, it'll be 9%. And uh, it's exactly the global financial crisis, which we saw in America, happening here in Australia today. And we've reached the logical conclusion of everything. Australian banks have $1.5 trillion of the mortgages. And the we're, not operating, we're not operating in a smart way, Matt. And, but we keep pushing the pain down the road, don't we? We never really feel the pain. With COVID even, we just borrowed our way out of the pain. Uh, now we have this massive uh, government debt that we haven't had before. You add mm. to that, as you said, the household debt. I mean, if government debt, state and federal is running at about one and a half trillion, I think. What is the household private debt on top of that? Uh, it's two, well, 211% of GDP. I think it's probably significantly higher right now. I mean, if you think about the household, right? Uh, in, in Australia, 62% um, of renters in Australia are in, are in rental stress. And that means that in, in a given month, their outflows are greater than their, their inflows. 48% of mortgages in Australia are in, in mortgage stress. In New South Wales, 70% of renters are, on rent, are in rental stress, right? And the, the remarkable thing is, of all the immigrants we're bringing in, right, and, and we're basically get, getting them in to, to trick them to work in a cafe uh, for the most part, because Australians can't afford, despite the highest casual wages in the world, um, Australians can't afford to work in, in, in many, many jobs that you know, have casual staff. We bring people in to work in those cafes for a bit, tricking them, thinking that you know, there's a great lifestyle here before they realise they can't afford it either, right? Mm. Um, and, and we've created a, a, a crisis of all proportions where we've got you know, rampant inflation, we've got ramp, and, and, and the root of all evil in Australia is really housing, housing and land costs. Housing and land costs mean that you know, businesses get crimped because yeah, believe it or not, Sydney restaurants and Melbourne restaurants pay more, more per square metre to rent than, than Manhattan and more than LA. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Right? So when a business is paying astronomical land costs, they're paying the highest casual wages in the world, yet on those casual wages, people can't live, right? What we've yeah. decided to do is bring in a whole bunch of you know, students in inverted commas to try and make it work. 
and that's gone on for way too long and we've reached the logical conclusion of a Ponzi scheme. At some point, you know, you, you've got to find more and more chumps to, to, to trick to come in and to buy a house and Sydney house prices are at astronomical levels. I mean, social economists say that um, if, the, if the median household price yep. for the median household income is three times or less, housing is affordable. If it's three to four times, it's unaffordable. If it's four to five times, it's severely unaffordable. And five and above is 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 is, is extremely unaffordable. Trouble. Yeah. Sydney Where are we is at? Thirteen point three. Sorry. Thirteen point three. Sydney's thirteen point three. Oh my God. It's the second most expensive housing market in the world outside of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is a tiny little island with limited space outside the most populous nation in the world. So we're at thirteen point. There's no reason why Sydney, in the middle of nowhere, it's a beautiful place to live. It's beautiful. You can see the harbour behind me. It's beautiful. Great people, great lifestyle, great, great food in, in a way. But there's no reason why Sydney should be 13.3. New York and London are seven. So yeah. at this point, house prices have gone way too far because every government doesn't know what to do and they kick the can down the road. House prices need to half or wages need to double, right? Businesses can't afford to double wages unless they sack a lot of people. And so house prices have to halve. And the only way we can get house prices to halve, we can't, we can't increase supply because we've been trying desperately for two decades to build houses. Even before that, when the, in the lead up to the, for example, the Sydney 2000 Olympics, we had a massive home building exercise in Australia. That's been continuing, continuing since 2000. Um, we've got, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. There's like 868 cranes in Australia building houses, 365 of them in Australia, uh, sorry, in Sydney, and there's 10 in New York and 14 in Chicago. So we, we've been wow. on this ridiculous householding building binge we're the fourth highest nation in the OECD in terms of rate of building house supply, which unlike what Philip Lowe said, I think, last night or the day before, where he said, oh, we're not building enough houses. We're building, we've, we've been going flat chat. We can't, we're not being able to increase the number of tradies in the, in the country, um, uh, despite record uh, immigration. And the tradies, for example, in New South Wales, where I live, they've been, they've been capped around 300,000 because every time costs go up and, ha and, and prices go up and so forth, they flee to Queensland or somewhere or the country or somewhere cheaper they can afford to live, right? Yeah. So create an unbearable situation where the easy relentless growth is basically push, 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 push house prices. And we're at the, the logical limit of what households can afford. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the housing crisis is often spoken of in terms of supply problem. Mm. It's a supply problem. We need to be building more properties. You're saying we, we can't? We're doing too much? Uh, there were 1,700 uh, insolvencies in construction um, in the last uh, 12 months. Um, you know, all, all these apartment builders are going uh, bust because they've gone into fixed price contracts to build these apartments and inflation has driven up the raw material prices and inflation is driving up wages, right? So yeah. they actually can't afford to, 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 to build the, the projects. Can't go record ahead. insolvencies. The tradies are leaving. We haven't managed, in a decade, we haven't managed to budge the trading number. And now we've got the Brisbane um, Olympics coming up. And so every trade and their dog is going up to Brisbane to get better pay rates to build, that, build out the, the, the stadiums and so forth for the Olympics that are coming up. So we can't increase supply. So therefore, the only thing we can do is reduce demand. And Albanese has gone full burko on immigration the other way around, turning every single tap he can on in a desperate attempt to prop everything up. So, you know, removing the, um, you know, lifting the, the, the cap on, 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 on permanent migrants, uh, removing the, the skilled list, um, you know, uh, letting in the New Zealanders, God knows we'll let the Tasmanians in soon next, that's a joke. But, um, you know, just every, you know, uh, basically um, allowing anyone who's uh, here, I think it's 2.1 at the moment, the temporary skilled visa in the country, uh, a path to, permanent, um, to uh, permanent residency and so on. Every possible tap you can turn on, he's turned on in a full Ponzi move, um, desperately attempting to keep the housing market by, by therefore the, 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 the banks solvent um, because we're going to head into a GFC style event. Every housing market around the world has had a bubble uh, pretty much in the Western world and, and, and deflated eventually. And we have doubled down and we're actually at the limit now of what households can afford. Everyone, everyone knows it. Everyone walking around, you go to the pub and there's a steak for sale for 56 bucks and it might be a, a nice steak, but Jesus Christ, wasn't? <laughs> how did that happen? I remember beers are a dollar, you know, dollar, two dollars, right? You know, 20, 30 years ago. Why, why now? 15 bucks, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So we're at the limit. Yeah. So, I mean, you've sounded the alarm on this 
for some time. I remember uh, a piece you wrote in 2017 called House of Cards that went completely viral on many platforms, this article. And, and the, the, it really spoke to the lack of uh, breadth of our economic diversity in Australia, that we, we have a very, very narrow economy built on mining and everything else is stacked narrowly on top of that. And yet here we are saying, let's turn off gas and coal, uh, which could possibly cause that house of cards to collapse. What is your take on, uh, you know, the, the, why other people are not sounding this alarm as, as much as you are? Uh, some critics of yours have said that, you know, you, you're too alarmist. Um, it, your thesis sounds pretty right to me. Um, what, what, what's your take on why you are one of the few voices uh, crying out there? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a few reasons. Um, first of all, just just to talk a little about the economy, just briefly as a preface, um, in terms of economic complexity, you're you're really you're dead on correct. Um, outside of iron ore, coal, gas, and, and and gold, and and followed by that, you know, immigration, justice, education, we do very little in this country, unfortunately. We used to do things like make cars. You know, in in 1995, you know, we were a car manufacturer at Holden, right? We've let manufacturing this country um, waste away, and it's on par with with a financial haven, as I said before, like like uh, Luxembourg or a, a, a nation like Botswana. We can go and see cheetahs, right? We, yep. we rank 91st in the world, 91st as a country at about 190 in the world for economic complexity by the Harvard um, uh, by Harvard. So uh, the economic complexity index is a measure of how complex your economy is, how diverse it is, how many different branches you've got to the economy that you can rely on. If one branch collapsed, you've got the other one to pick it up. We are way down. I think we're below Ghana, aren't we? We're behind Guatemala, Laos and right. Kenya, right? Okay. We are, like, it's we're doing great. Are, right? <laughs> and so successive governments have, have thought, okay, well, how do we deal with this? We'll deal with it on two fronts. We'll, well basically, we'll deal, we'll deal with it on immigration, so we'll let a lot of people into the country and immigration has its place and it is, is very useful, but you've got to balance out an immigration system with skills that are needed and the local populace, right? And, and, and really what, what, what really has been managed is house prices. As long as house prices go up, um, generally speaking, the government thought everything was okay, but they've gone up so far and so extreme and so off kilter with, with the rest of the world um, that we're at the point now where it just affects everything. It affects affects businesses, it affects you know, you know, your everyday life and why you can't afford to get a meal, it affects you know, energy prices, it affects everything, right? And, and, and it's so expensive as a result to do things like manufacture here, right? And so we don't do very much here. We do very little here. It's about 5.5% is manufacturing as a percentage of, of, of gross value add. So, so it, you know, we're at, a, we're at a point now, we've let it all fall away. And it's a bit like you know, an old, an old um, comment about, about being a banana republic, right? That banana republic comment that was made back in the, in the yep. 90s was yep. around having just one export. And um, we don't really have one export. We've got about three or four major exports, but those exports all go to one country. So effective in a way, we are a bit of a banana economy. I mean, everything that we do in terms of uh, that we produce and dig out of the ground and we don't turn into anything that's higher value or or more complex, we ship to China, 34% of that. And in return, we take 2% of Chinese exports back. So we're completely beholden to China, right? Yeah, and it's a uh, we're at the point now where it's 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 I think it's the end of the road. It's simply kick the can as far as you can, and a lot of government intervention has come in. Uh, and while government government intervention comes in, you can push things a long, long, long way. But we're at the point now where a household generates so much income in terms of wages, that's dictated by what businesses can afford. The businesses aren't doing particularly <laughs> particularly well unless maybe you've been a bank or you've you've been you know, in, in, at, a, at a mine. And, and, and now we're at the point where you can't afford the rent, you can't afford the energy uh, the prices, you can't afford a nice meal, you can't afford to go out. And we're at that, at that point where we're up to our gills in debt. How do we broaden the economic base then, Matt? How do we make our economy more complex? How do we bring back manufacturing when, you know, you've got countries around the world that are not paying decent wages, they are competing against us in an unfair marketplace? Uh, we, we can't afford to manufacture here. And when we do manufacture, we, we, it's too expensive. It's easier to, cheaper to import. It's hard to get any, well, any bucks for our exports. 
There's a few things we can we can do. Uh, one is we do need to bring down land prices as a, as a percentage of everything else, right? I mean, they're just astronomically high. So that leads to the high wages in, in order to be able to pay the rent and, and this, that, the other. So we do need to, we've got to bring that ratio down. There's a range of things we can do, right? There's a range of measures in terms of, you know, if, if people are turning up to universities and then, you know, going to work at a 7-Eleven and not actually going to uni. And, and apparently the scam everyone tells me on Twitter is you come into a, a university in, in, in Australia, you then six months later, you get your overseas visa, you go work, uh, you then drop out to an RTO or a vet sort of education system, which is designed really to get you a visa and nothing else. And then you go off and work, right? We can mm. crack down on that. We can crack down on, on the, the, the sheer rate um, and so forth. But then the flip side of what else we can do is we can, we can raise the skills. We have for, for a very long period of time, we've neglected the skills of our domestic citizens, right? We've, we, you know, the, the universities went crazy trying to attract foreign students and I know, because I was an adjunct professor for 14 years at the University of Sydney, you had ridiculous situations where the domestic students were prejudiced uh, for the international students because they'll turn up at 9 a.m. for a maths class then have to hang around till 4 p.m., 5 p.m. For, for some of the advanced courses because we had to cater to international students who had to work during the day, right? Mm. So we can build, build those skills. We, need, we, can, we can do things with advanced um, manufacturing techniques. We can do things with, with robotics. Um, we, 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 we do do a fair bit of scientific research in this country, but we, we need to get more people into technology and science and particularly manufacturing. I think we had a big opportunity during COVID to instead of pay people for sitting on the bums at home to actually put them into you know, online education, whether it's you know, at the TAFEs in, 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 in the blue collar jobs and the, and the machining jobs and so forth through to, through to um, degrees. I think there's a lot we can do about about getting domestic uh, students educated rather than just completely try and bring in um, economic migrants who are pretending to be international students. So we, we build the skills up, up. We really try and concentrate in areas where we, you know, we've got a lot of raw materials that can be elaborately transformed into, into higher, end, higher, end, um, higher end goods. Um, and, and we should do that. I know there's some stuff happening with green, um, green hydrogen and so forth, but yeah, if you go speak to, I've got one of my friends is, is one of the senior scientists at Woodside Petroleum. They've got a lot of ideas about what we can do with the gas that we generate out of the ground. Um, there's a lot of things we can do you know, with Australian smarts. We just have to have a government that that is, that is, is, is you know talks the right message, and and we've got to reset some of the relative prices of things. We seem to want to have it all, though, don't we? We want to have the the net zero, uh, but you know we are reliant upon. Uh, coal and gas. We don't want to do nuclear because we're worried about the effects of nuclear, yet there seems to be a whole industry there just begging uh, for Australia to sort of seize it. Uh, are, you, are you getting the ear of politicians? Are people listening? I mean, what's your take on the current state of our no. political class? Well, no, I absolutely agree with you on nuclear. We absolutely should do nuclear. And it was probably a bit of a mistake to turn off the coal-fired power plants. We probably should build some more modern, um, efficient uh, uh, power plants. So we, I, I don't think we're ready for net zero. Um, and I, and I, I think Australia, in terms of the, of the, of the global impact um, you know, on emissions, if, if emissions are you know, a, a major issue, and I don't think they're, they're the emergency that everyone kind of raves well, on. Well, the point is, I mean, we're not going to make any impact on net zero whatsoever. Nothing yeah, that nothing, Australia nothing, does nothing. is going to no, have we're a diddly squat impact. impact. In the short term. And yeah. look, look yeah. and I certainly believe in the longer term, you know, I think, well, I think, I think pollution generally is bad and we should make sure we've got a great environment. And by the way, bringing a lot of people is not great for the environment. Um, no. But, you know, I, don't, I think we're certainly not ready to, to do an instant transition. And I think we should definitely be building nuclear. Um, and then one reason people don't really understand what's going on in the world is because journalism with the advent of the internet and the Google sort of model for ads has meant that um, journalism has been greatly reduced. The media companies have been um, uh, you know, really now driven to produce 500 word articles that have clickbait headlines to drive the Google ad machine. And um, as a result, nobody can string a coherent narrative together. I mean, it's only segments like this where you sit down and do an in-depth interview with a, with, a, with a level of intelligence discourse that people actually start to string together little 500 word articles that they kind of see here, there on, 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 on websites to figure out what's going on. Yeah. People know that something's wrong, but they can't actually figure it out because there's, there's no in-depth analysis of this. The other flip side is that the two major dominant media companies um, in this country, which is you know, News Limited and, and, and um, Fairfax, their gr growth machine, their cash cow, are the two major property classifieds. So REA is somewhere around 74% of News Corp's market cap, and Domain is somewhere around 34% of uh, Fairfax's market cap. 
So it's not in their interest to talk about this. In fact, you're more likely to find a story in, you know, on those websites about a train driver who is jobless with a $40 million property portfolio than you are about, hey, this is actually, you know, here, here's an interesting uh, person who's set up a manufacturing plant and this is what he's doing and this, you know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great business, you know, let, let's go out there and do more of this. You're more, you're more likely to hear about a McDonald's worker with a, with a 15 million bucks worth of property who's hanging on for dear life. And let me tell you, with the global financial <laughs> crisis in the US, exactly what happened there is exactly what's happening here. 1.95% yeah. mortgages going up to 8, 9% plus, and God knows where it will end. The official inflation rate's 7%. Right, the unofficial inflation rate, which anyone with half a half a clue with looking around them will go, it's got to be at least 10, 15 percent. But based on the prices of everything going up, their rent going up. The rent's not going up by seven. The rent's going up by 15. No. Right. Yeah. So everyone. So knows, so knows these are the big costs. Uh, hmm. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is based on a basket of goods. Hmm. That basket of goods is not necessarily reflective of what everybody is feeling. Uh, mm. and that the real inflation rate, when you bring it down to things like rent, uh, is a lot higher. You mentioned there the McDonald's worker who might have a $15 million property portfolio, uh, but $16 million worth of debt on it, um, and, and the whole thing could just collapse. Explain for people who don't understand the economics the connection between interest rates and inflation. Right. Well, um, if inflation is really high, so for example, the price of things are going up all the time, 10%, you, know, you come in and your beer is 11 bucks, and you come in next year at 12, 12 bucks, and you come in now it's $14. You know, to try and take that heat out of the economy, you've got to get people to save. You've got to get people to put money yeah. into, their, into their bank accounts, right? And to do that, typically what, what happens is the, the RBA issues a, a sort of a policy rate, which is the rate at which the banks can kind of lend from the, can, can borrow from the RBA. And, and in return, the interest rate on things like your deposit account is supposed to go up so people save more, and the cost of your mortgage is supposed to go up so people lend, borrow less, right? Um, it's a kind of a bizarre situation at the moment. You go to the Commonwealth Bank, Commonwealth Bank has $639 billion worth of mortgages, uh, residential mortgages. It's about $150 billion of uh, business lending and about like 17, 17 billion of consumer finance. Their deposit account pays 0%. Zero. Yeah. zero. Zero. Yeah. So why, why would you put your money in your standard everyday account at zero percent? Why would you save anything at all? Right. So even even if the you know, so 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 um, you know as as interest rates go up, mortgages get more expensive. People are less likely to borrow. And at the moment, I've been told from my friends that work in banking, the banks are really pulled back lending in a in a big way. But they're not yeah. giving you any more to put your money in the bank account. So there's, there's I think there's a, a real problem here. There was a, there was a banking crisis in the U.S. over the last couple of months. So. Many people might be aware of it with Silicon Valley Bank and, and, and um, Silvergate and so forth. Now, Silicon Valley Bank was actually doing really great business. You know, it's the main bank for technology in the U.S. And technology has up until uh, you know, the last 12 months been going gangbusters. Yeah, it was and huge. Then their, their deposits had uh, tripled or quadrupled in like three years. So yeah. like about $190 billion of deposits um, coming in. For, and it was 60 only about three or four years ago. So Should be really solid, right? Bank, that business was going great. It was yeah. going really, really well. The problem is they had not enough to lend to. And so, that, so they decided to stick it into mortgages. So they, they bought about um, 80 billion of mortgages and some T-bills, but about 92 billion they invested in these 10-year um, uh, or long, long-term mortgage-backed securities, at an average yield of about 1.5%, 1.56%. The problem was that in the latter half of last year, things didn't go so great for the tech sector. There's a crypto crash, there's a tech crash, you know, there's a lot of layoffs, and a lot of these startups couldn't raise money because the venture capitalists pulled back funding, right? As a result, these startups, tech companies, burnt down the cash balances they had at Silicon Valley Bank and needed to withdraw more and more and more money. And that went on deeper and longer than expected, which led to an a, a insolvency crisis with Silicon Valley Bank because Silicon Valley Bank had to sell those mortgage-backed uh, securities. And the problem was the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates from basically zero to five and a bit percent um, in one of the, the fastest, if not the fastest tightening cycle ever, which caught all the banks off by surprise. As a result, if you can go and get, um, uh, uh, in the US, you could get a deposit um, account at call in the money market for about um, 3%. Why would you want to buy a mortgage um, that's paying 1.56, right? Now, yeah. if you, people were prepared to wait 10 years to get their money back, yeah, you'll get your money back, but in a, in a crisis, Silicon Valley Bank had to dump all those mortgage-backed securities and, and T-bills. And it did so at a, at a massive, I think it was a 20-something billion dollar haircut. 
And that yeah. led to basically Big insolvency loss. or bank run because everyone was, everyone was concerned that it was running out of assets that could sell that were liquid in order to pay everyone back. Uh -huh. Now, you look at the Commonwealth Bank and you look at NAB and you look at all the other Australian banks, you know, with their $1.5 trillion of the mortgages. I mean, the latest results look pretty good. You know, you know, rec you know profits and this, that, the other. It's looking, looking, looking great. But the fact of the matter is that it could be in a very much a very similar scenario to Silicon Valley Bank in the fact that business was great was for Silicon Valley Bank. It was fantastic for Silicon Valley Bank. But like Silicon Valley Bank, what's Commonwealth Bank got to lend to? It's, it's, the tech yeah. industry here is not existent. It does very little. It has $150 billion of lending to, to, to corporates, $639 billion to mortgages. Now, if we go into a recession and things are getting tough and, and you know, costs have gone up and inflation goes up and house prices continue to soar and, and so forth, you, know, you could have default correlation across the spectrum with Australian households going, I can't afford to pay the mortgage anymore. Because I, you know, or, or my renter, if I'm an investor, my renters can't afford to pay anymore. I can't find anyone anymore to, to pay these sort of astronomical rents. And all of a sudden, you've got a problem on one side where your assets, being your mortgages, aren't being paid off. And you've got another problem on the other side where balances are being drawn down because people have to survive. So they're drawing down their savings in order to live because everything's too expensive, right? Yeah. And the Australian banks are only being propped up because of immigration, because business savings are dropping at, at, at these banks that's one of the cost bank the business 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 deposits are dropping the business is not, not doing particularly well um and they're being propped up by by consumer deposits which are basically is being propped up by immigration so people come into the country they need a bank account they're going to open a bank account one of the big four they put money into the banks to capitalize them as a result for example commonwealth bank 75 percent um, of their mortgages are backed by, um, uh, of the book is backed by deposits. So that looks quite good. It's significantly better than it was in the global financial crisis where effectively Australian banks were insolvent because they're probably reliant upon overseas um, uh, funding to, to stay solvent. But we could very well, even though the banks look good now, we could very well be in a situation where people can't pay their mortgages, costs are too high, you know, businesses continue to not do that great. Um, and then maybe immigration turns around because they're reading all the, all, the, all the news reports about a Chinese student coming in having to pitch a tent in the living room for 300 bucks or go out to Eagle Vale for 130 bucks. You can pitch a tent in someone's backyard. Right. So maybe you know, some of the students go, mm, maybe I shouldn't come here. Right. And, and then we might have a problem as people draw down their bank accounts. So we could very well end up in a, in a Silicon Valley bank situation where you go ostensibly the business looks great. But actually, fundamentally, you've got a lot of default correlation in there and you've got a lot, and you've got a lot of problems on, on, on both sides of the book. It's a pretty depressing <laughs> a picture you're painting for us all, but it is, I think, a time, I think, politically, where we need some very smart, very pro-business, very uh, fiscally responsible, prudent kind of leadership. But politically, the country is swinging to the left, not to the right. Uh, does that concern you, that we are now, we see policymakers that are, you know, we've got a Labor, uh, a very supported by Green sort of government situation in every state in Australia and federally. What hope well, do you think of getting out of this? We don't have any Paul Keatings on the Labor side anymore, or, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a bit of a crisis, actually. I mean, Albo's chosen to take a, a path of let's distract you with everything that, other than the important things that matter. Um, and I think I think that now he's just gone full Burko on like let's just flood the country with people and just hope that we can kick the can down the road long enough. Um, but I think it's a real problem. I think it's a problem on both sides. I, I think the Liberal Party oh, totally. had a crisis and, and in terms of leadership, and that's why I got voted out. Um, and, I, and I think I think the the, the, the Labor Party has a, has a problem, and I don't really see any good uh, people in the political stock in this country <laughs> at all, to tell you the truth. Well, we're not getting the talent through, that's for sure. We talk about that quite a lot on this show, but um, it seems that uh, the populace... I mean, people generally, uh, with the exception of the people who watch, uh, watch ADH TV probably, uh, don't seem to understand the economic implications of their voting. Uh, they don't seem to, because they're not feeling it immediately. And so what we're doing is we're rewarding short-termism in government and short-term thinking uh, so that governments are just looking to the next election and making sure everybody's happy and we kick the can down the road three years, well, that'll get us re-elected, then we'll kick it down another three years. Nobody's doing what, you know, less democratic places like Singapore do and say, well, let's look at our 20-year plan or China, we'll look at our 50-year plan. Um, and, and I'm not supporting, you know, undemocratic or, or authoritarian uh, uh, regimes, but it does beg the question, 
how with the current system we've got do we get long-term thinkers and reward long-term thinking if the public don't value that and don't reward that don't reward the politicians that do that I mean, that's a great question. I mean, you, let's look at this. There's two parts to that. One is if you look at the populist side of voting in Australia, I mean, the Teals are a classic example of that. I mean, that was a bit of a protest vote against Liberal Party, where ostensibly you know, quite a large demographic of the Liberal vote went to the Teals. I mean, that vote, that basically their policy is something, 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 climate change and nothing else, mm. right? You are, you are, there's nothing about foreign policy. There's nothing about the economy or technology or anything like that. It's a zero, right? It's just basically a protest vote and I want, I want to feel good about myself, so let's vote Teal for climate change and there's nothing else, right? Well, um, and in Brisbane, Matt, just before you go on, in Brisbane where we didn't have the Teals, the inner city three major electorates like Sydney and Melbourne with the Teals, we have the Greens. Uh, right. So the three federal electorates of Brisbane, the central electorates of Brisbane, huge area, is all green federally now, which right. says that the inner city Australian mindset is simply climate change focused uh, the Greens are a bit scarier than the Teals in that they bring a lot, even more socialist sort of thinking and policy in those other areas you mentioned. Um, this seems to be where we're heading. Is there any hope, do you think, on the political well, front? Well, just, just to finish that side up, um, before I talk about Singapore a little bit, um, so, I mean, the problem, the, the Greens' solution to the housing crisis is to try and cap rents. And while I do appreciate, you know, the, that that's the ultimate outcome they want in terms of, you know, trying to keep the, the, the cost of rent down, to cap it will just make things 10 times worse because yes. I just cast, I mean, like anywhere you've seen price controls, you, you make the problem just astronomically worse. So that that won't work. Um, you think about Singapore and forward thinking. I mean, Singapore um, have invested a billion dollars in AI, right? And AI, let me tell you, uh, is a major, um, uh, the, 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 the change that's gonna happen in the next 12 months, thanks to artificial intelligence, will be greater, I believe, than the impact of the commercial internet you know, in 1994, 95. In 1994, the geeks had email addresses because 1991 was the year that turned on the universities. By 94, the geeks had email addresses everywhere. And 95 was the year grandmother had an email address, right? And yeah. you think about how big the impact of the internet has been. AI is going to have a much, much bigger impact than that. There's been a re massive breakthrough really in the last six to 12 months in, in artificial intelligence where they've figured out effectively how to train software to do human jobs based on large training data sets. And the larger the training data set, the more intelligent and the better that the, this AI gets. Um, there's currently a, a thing out from Goldman saying that 300 million people in white collar jobs around the world are gonna lose them thanks to AI in the next couple of years. And 25% of, of, of jobs in Australia are potentially impacted as a result of AI. The reason why is anyone who's played with Midjourney will know that Midjourney is a software package can can illustrate as good as or better than a graphic designer now. You've got ChatGPT, which I'm sure every school kid's getting to do their homework right now, can write uh, copy as good as or better than you know people writing essays and so forth and other forms of, yeah. of copy. You're about to have software write itself uh, better than software programmers. What's gonna happen is the impact of AI on the world is gonna have as much of an impact in terms of social displacement as mechanization of agriculture in the 18th and the 19th centuries and the mechanization of manufacturing the 20th century. Only this time round, it's gonna have the impact on the intellectual classes, the white collar jobs. It's kind of, kind of ironic in a way, all the software bros have been telling the truck drivers uh, for the last couple of decades, Berlin had a code. Now the truck drivers might be telling the software programmers Berlin had to drive a truck in a way. But um, yeah. the point is that Singapore's made a massive investment in this to try and be on top of it because, you know, hopefully all technologies do create more jobs than they destroy, but there is always temporary dislocation. You yes. know, when you can, you know, when refrigerators came out and you, you, you couldn't sell ice anymore, you know, in, in you know, off the back of a truck, there was temporary dislocation, but ultimately more jobs were created. This time around, I'm not sure what's going to happen because the AI is going to continually get better and better and better. And maybe, you know, maybe this time around there's going to be a real struggle, but there'll certainly be this social dislocation. But Singapore's investing a billion dollars to try and get on top of it and create high-end jobs that take advantage of this and build companies that can take advantage of this to try and build a solid future. And in Australia, we don't have very many people. We've got 26 million people. In order to maintain the standard of living that we've had in the past, which is rapidly ero eroding, we're in absolutely reverse gear right now. I saw this morning 20 to 24-year-olds in Australia, their standard of living has reversed back to 2008. Yeah, prices haven't reversed back to 2008, right? It, 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 it's, it's a crisis. So Singapore's getting on top of this by creating high-end jobs, 
which will lead to high-end startups, businesses, technologies, so forth, whatever, to create a future for themselves, right? We need to be doing things like this, and it's not just in AI, it's manufacturing, it's engineering, and it's engineering outside of civil, which is just building buildings for people. It's, you know, it's in, in the other forms engineering, it's chemical engineering to transform, you know, the gas that we produce out of the ground into petrochemicals, whether it's, you know, electrical engineering to, you know, produce the next version of robotics or what have you. Um, but we've got to be doing this, and we've got to be doing it now, and we've got to, we've got to string the dots between year 10 in school, where kids make their decisions about their GC, and a career and the future. And, we got, and, and it, I actually think it's one of the fastest ways we can turn this country around is get more people into the skilled education in the trades and in, um, and in uh, you know, degrees, uh, but the right degrees, right? Um, but and, what are the right them. degrees? If you're advising parents who've got kids going into university now, yeah. what would you tell them? Well, let me, let me, tell, let me tell you this much. Unfortunately, uh, you know, while, while you might think from a, a, an intellectual or a theater, theoretical perspective, you know, all fields of study are, are equal and human knowledge, you know, it's great to push the boundaries of human knowledge for the future. Yeah, no, I don't think that, Matt. <laughs> and, well, and you can think about that from a maybe philosoph philosophical perspective, but from a contribution to the economy perspective, you know, some, many degrees completely outweigh others in terms of, uh, in terms of job opportunities and in terms of economic impact to the country, Right. You know, I've had people apply for a job here for me um, who have had antiquities degrees from Cambridge or literature de degrees from Oxford. But when your PhD is in Tolkien, right, it doesn't really practically lend itself to the real world. In fact, the people who applied for those sort of jobs actually had you know, applied for very, very, very low wages. Well, if you come out and, you, and, you, and you're, for example, a computer programmer, at the moment, you know, you, you can, as a graduate, you can come to a salary of, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 K starting salary, right? Well, the literature um, students um, struggle to get you know, anything above the minimum wage and maybe end up working in a cafe, right? If you think about it, we've created, unfortunately, a leaderboard situation with the, you know, with the, with the high school system where you've got your ATAR and then you've got a leaderboard of what you can get into um, from school, right? And at the top of that, we've got medicine and law. Now, I think we will need more in healthcare. Um, uh, we're certainly getting an aging population. The, the numbers are going to skyrocket in terms of Australia. And there is a crisis in things like um, you know, aged care and, 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 and so on. And that, that was going to, only going to get that, that bigger. Parts of medicine will be replaced by AI, such as G, the, you know, your GP. I think most of what a GP does, there was a paper just published recently where ChatGPT was preferred by 79% of people over a, a traditional doctor because uh, the responses were four times longer, uh, uh, four times better, and 10 times more empathetic. And in fact, ChatGPT will be very patient to sit down with a 80 year old and talk to them for four hours or eight hours or forever, right? Well, a GP will probably want to see the next patient, right? Um, and, and certainly there's applications in forms of medics, medicine where AI will certainly help. But I think, look, medicine is important. Uh, there was a point, however, only a couple of years ago where we couldn't get enough residencies for graduates out of the university system in order to, 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 to graduate properly. But God knows we don't need any more, more lawyers in the world. And let me tell you, the law, the law profession is going to be wiped out by AI. Mm. Um, the deal makers will be fine. The guys at the top end of law will be fine. They, they'll be willing and dealing and, and, and so forth. But, you know, drafting now, chat GPT can write you a stock purchase agreement, a cease and desist, an employment agreement, what have you. And effectively, it's free and it's only going to get better. Uh, Minter Ellison well, and it could also run an entire case. You know, I mean, you could just yeah. load in your data from the case and it'll go find the best case law and give you the answer and the result that you're most likely to get in a snap. Uh, under any particular jurisdiction in the world, I mean, it's not looking good for lawyers. No, it's not. It's not. And in fact, in fact, they're trying to get it to argue in court. Of course, the legal profession has created a bit of a guild around itself, and it's all, all very, you know, even today you can't pay a barrister directly. You've got to go to solicitor. So it's all very archaic and very guild-like. But, but the fact of the matter is, it's going to change rapidly. I mean, Minter Ellison was, which is Australia's biggest law firm, was first to panic, uh, with the CEO uh, coming out and saying. Uh, our clients are pondering whether it's um, whether you know billable hours is really the best way to recognise the value. I mean that's 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 rubbish. I mean like they, they know the writing's yeah. on the wall. That drafting, which is a very large percentage of, of what uh, lawyers do, is gone. I certainly would not want to send my kids uh, into a uh, studying a legal degree in the world of AI. It's a very rules based very much knowledge based, read lots of, you know, write, you know, construct arguments, this, that, the other, and the AI is extremely good and can do it better, right? So that is not an area I'd want to send my kids. And then, and then you know, when I went through uh, high school, I went to a pretty decent private school here in Sydney. You know, I thought, I hadn't even heard the word engineer 
until careers day and careers day they didn't mention engineering and someone's dad was there and said i happen to be a biome biomechanical engineer Gosh. I thought, what's that wow. is this something to do with driving a train right yeah, I, yeah. Went, I went back and did careers day and the kids still thought it was something to do with driving a train <laughs> so in engineering still worthwhile and you mentioned computer programming of course the ai will be able to do the computer programming but we need still need people who are going to be able to understand computer programming you're exactly to... you're exactly right so what what what's actually happening is every white collar job will go up the stack right so yeah. what i've noticed for example with with mid journey and the design uh, ai and let me tell you the, the revolution here was unbelievable it was only august of last year that stable diffusion was released which is an open source package which you know the, the big the big tech companies have been working away at this for a few years and kept it to themselves and all of a sudden someone released an open source thing which means it's free and uh you can you can you can get the code and you can modify it however you will and um it's absolutely crazy august of last year you would download this software package and you type in a sentence and it'll make a little illustration for you and you'd stuff around for three and a half hours or so and it wasn't particularly good but it was kind of artistic fast forward to today and my niece can type in a, a sentence and it is photorealistic, absolutely incredible quality output, right? Wow. So six months, it's gone from zero to, you know, completely changing the world of design forever. What I'm seeing, however, is the designers are going up the stack. Now, designers are by very nature creative, and the AI right now is not very creative. The AI can do very, 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 very well anything that's rules-based or requires knowledge, you know, encyclopedic knowledge or... Um, construct an argument and this that the other but in creativity it's not really there yet what we are seeing is we're seeing that uh, jobs are going up the stack and designers now are becoming more like a director or a producer so what they're learning is what does a 75 millimeter lens do what does a 200 millimeter lens do what does a circular polarizing filter do what does color gradient do and they're learning the language of the job the level up which is basically being the producer the cinematographer the director and so forth right and I think the same is going to happen to every white collar job. So for example, programmers might not be there on the code, writing the code. They may be more of a product manager. They'll be like going, okay, I want a website. It's like an Uber for pets. Uh, now put something above the fold. Now do this, now do that. And they're, they're thinking more strategically, more creatively, and more, more like, as increasingly more like the CEO, right? So I think that's where all jobs are going to go. They're going to go up the stack. But at the lower levels, we probably won't need so many people. We won't need yeah. so many lawyers. Accounting, I think, will be almost entirely wiped out because accounting is very, very rules-based. And the government doesn't want you to be creative with, with, with accounting. And in fact, if you are being creative, there's a problem, right? So that's Yeah, exactly. So anything that's rules-based, repetitive, easy to replicate, that can all be done by AI. Matt, we, we are out of time. I've got to thank you so much for your time. I have got to ask you, it'd be remiss of me if I, if I didn't. Um, how are things going with uh, Freelancer? Uh, what are your plans for the future to sort of combat? I mean, you were, you were king of the castle there for a while. You've got some competitors coming in like Fiverr now that are yep. posing a little bit of a challenge. Uh, what are your plans to sort of uh, take, take the lead again? Well, I think, I, I think we're in a pretty good position because we actually have the wor la largest workforce in the world that's online. There's about 67 million freelancers now. Uh, but we've got, we've got the very broad uh, number of skill sets. They range everything from get a $5 or $10 job done right through to today. Uh, we're, the, our, our largest job currently running now is a $6 million US dollar project in gene editing for the National Institute of Health in America and NASA. We just completed a $1 million uh, augmented reality, virtual reality project for um, NIST for first responders going into uh, emergency situations like bombings or earthquakes where they can put the heads up display on it. It's like Minority Report. The great thing about AI for our workforce in particular, being the broadest and covering, you know, you know, is that any freelancer now powered by AI is now super skilled. So if you've got a lot of talent in emerging markets, you know, low cost market, that's now super skilled. And so skilled labor available online through the cloud is very, very high, very accessible. And for all these companies, for example, in Australia that are struggling to hire yeah. people because they can't pay the wages, there are some skills you don't need all the time. Maybe you don't need a full-time designer if you're a cafe. You can just go as a freelancer now and get a brochure done for 10, 20 bucks as opposed to hiring a full-time designer. So there's, there's yeah. a bunch of things you can do now through our workforce and they're all super powered. Yep. It's the way of the future, I guess. And uh, uh, good to hear that you guys are at the, at the forefront of that. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to adapt to the AI world. In the meantime, we'll all try to knuckle down and make sure we're uh, 
all being very fiscally responsible with our debt. <laughs> Make sure that we, we're able to weather the storm that's, uh, that's perhaps coming for our country. Hmm. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate your time. That's uh, Matt Barry from freelancer.com, the CEO, joining us on the other side interviews. Don't forget, you can catch the show on demand anytime you like. Please do share it with your friends. Uh, it's the only way that we can grow the independent media in Australia uh, is by you sharing it and supporting it uh, and helping us to, uh, to really uh, bring you more fantastic and insightful interviews like this one. And do join us on Friday nights for The Other Side Australia at eight o'clock every Friday night, your weekly summary of the best news and commentary from the week to take you into the weekend. And then of course, every Tuesday night at six, uh, streaming on ADH TV for The Other Side interviews. We'll catch you next Friday. This is Damien Curry saying bye for now.